Well, good morning. Hold on. Was anybody paying attention to that one? Good morning. Hey, there it is. And it's so beautiful outside. We got to bring some of that excitement and joy inside of here. It is so good to see all of you. I want to say thank you <laughs> for letting Angela and myself have three weeks off. Um, so many people, you know, are like, hey, you ever take time off from church? I'm like, no, not really, not unless I'm really sick. I say, you should. No, I'm good. I think I'm okay. I love worshiping with all of you guys. It doesn't even feel like work. This is just a wonderful thing that we get to do. And then my dad was like, no, you're going you're gonna to go, and you're going to go not for one or two weeks, but for three. Okay. And then it was week one when we went to another church, and we walked in as a family. Ten minutes before church started, and I thought, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I don't have to make sure the soundboard's on. I don't have to run the video. I don't have to grab music. I don't need to turn anything on. I just get to sit down next to my wife, and we get to do this thing called church. So um, it was awesome. We were able to uh, worship with brothers and sisters in town on two of the Sundays, and then one week we were down in Fort Wayne and got to meet some wonderful brothers and sisters down there. It's just been a wonderful time. So uh, thank you so much. Didn't know that we needed uh, kind of a reprieve, but we did. So that's a little uh, plug there. As you hear me say, every week I'm involved with something. You too can be involved in something. And it doesn't have to be every week. We've got uh, some wonderful gentlemen back there running our soundboard and our video and things like that. But that means they're also not sitting next to their spouses. And so if we could all uh, step up and say, you know what, I'm willing to take a month or I'm willing to take a couple uh, weeks, that would be a really awesome. Um, so if you're interested at all, let me know. Do not be intimidated by that, all the lights and things back there. It's actually quite easy to run. If my uh, 12-year-old son can run all the video and get us on YouTube, I think you too can also do it. So, But man, it is really good to be back worshiping uh, with all of you. We've been looking forward to it all week, saying, man, I can't wait to get back to MCC. So would you please stand with us and let us first hear from Psalm 116, it says, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is is full of compassion. I still read from the NIV. I just realized I forgot. We've got new members over the last three weeks. We've got new pew Bibles. I'm playing a new guitar. I mean, this is, this is just a fun week. But uh, anyway, we've got our ESV. That was out of the NIV, but uh, wonderful word anyway. Let us sing this fantastic uh, worship song, Yes, I Will. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same who's never been is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Your name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh yes, I will. I count on one thing. Same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. You've been the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out.
God's people said, amen, amen. No matter what's going on in your life, brothers and sisters, praise the Lord. In the greatest times, praise the Lord. In the hardest times, praise the Lord. In times of great temptation, praise the Lord. When we do that, he promises to draw us to him, and he will draw near to us. And the enemy must flee when we do that. Boy, it's good to be back worshiping with all of you. We invite you at this time to go ahead and have a seat right where... You are, as opposed to a pew in front of you. (laughs) Or go, feel free, kick somebody out. Just do it in a Christian manner. Or switch. Jeff, I wouldn't do that to you. (laughs) Well, good morning. Welcome to Madawan Community Church. It's good to see everybody this morning. I do have quite a few announcements to bring to your attention. So if you'd like a second to grab your pencil, you may do that. Okay, first, I do want to let everyone know that the newsletters went out yesterday. Those are in your email inbox, and there's also hard copies in the turnstile down at the bottom in the entryway, and there's a lot of sign-up sheets. Like I said, I got a lot, so I'm trying to figure out where I want to go here first. I'm going to go with this last. All right, while we do have WOW coming up this Wednesday... March 2nd, we will be starting at 6 o'clock, having dinner together is the plan. However, there is a vacancy to provide dinner for a while this Wednesday, if you would like to. Um, And I do want to make mention that there is also new WOW dinner coordinators. They are Marianne Lamb and Christine Ruger. So if you guys ever have any questions or anything like that, you may see them. Christine Ruger is here today. Obviously, Marianne is gone. So in the interim, if those two are not available, you can also see the Christian Ed Directors, which is Robin Moyer and Angela Lamb. So if you would like to provide dinner for that, you may get in touch with any one of those ladies today. Then, obviously, after dinner, hopefully, um, we will be going to our respective classes at 630, and I will continue to plug the chosen Bible story, the chosen Bible study that we are doing. I believe we are in, we're episode eight, seven, seven. We're still on seven. I'm jumping ahead here, guys. I'm sorry. We're still on seven. It is. And there's been some great discussions in there. So jump in wherever you can. That would be absolutely awesome. And then Thursday, March 3rd at 9 a.m., there is a ladies breakfast at LaRue's. And then Thursday, March 10th from 630 to 8 o'clock, there is a Bowls of Blessing that is at Freshwater Church. There is not a sign-up sheet for that. If you would like to attend, the address is in your bulletin. $25 gets you unlimited soup and bread. I'm sure they would love to have you and welcome you with open arms. Another thing that's also, this is, there is a sign-up sheet in the back for this, and you can also see Elizabeth Hammond about this, but this is a Love Your Neighbor Women's Retreat. Ladies, this is coming up quickly, March 11th through the 13th. There is one, two, three and three-day options for that. There's some information back in the fellowship room, a sign-up sheet, and as I said, if you have any questions at all, please talk to Elizabeth. Keep on going on sign-up sheets. This is coming up. We'll be at least in summer. I know I'm not talking about snow, so we'll at least be in the middle of summer. But VBS positions, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. There's also a sheet in the back there that shows what available positions we do have. 
Um, just so you know, that will be June 26th through the 30th. So if the Lord's tugging on your heart to serve there, please see back there in the sign-up sheet. If you have any questions as of right now, I believe you can talk to Angela and Robin. And then on to my next one. The big thing was volunteers. Volunteers needed. Obviously, VBS, we're talking about WOW Dinner. There's other WOW Dinners that you can sign up for. Fellowship hosts, also greeters for the front door. Would love to see those sign-up lists completely filled up. And to continue on, we do still have our World Mission Bibles. That is the mission of this month. They are in the back corner as you leave the sanctuary. They are also all over the fellowship room. Take one of these with you. Take it home, fill it up, and or take it to your work. And then, of course, as my final plug as it has been for the daily bread, there are new daily breads, the new small ones. We've got March, April, and May. These are in the front right when you come in. Take these. And as I mentioned before, if we can actually use up all of these and have to order more, that's fantastic. So continue to keep in the word daily. Would love to see us have to order 10 or 20 of these or more, 50 of them. Just like the Bibles. When I said the other day, when I said, take the Bible home with you, give it to somebody that you know. Give them one of these with it be awesome if we had to purchase more Bibles and more daily breads. Absolutely. So Alternatives is having their auction back in person this year. Oh, nice. So instead of it being online, it's going to be back at the Westwood. Okay. And so they need volunteers on March 18th to help set up, and then people to come, so... March 18th, Alternatives Auction, back in person. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Kenton. That's exciting. All right. Well, before we move on to worship and our next song, I would like to welcome everybody to stand up and welcome your neighbor and give them some of that beautiful MCC cheer. As Stephen said, sun's shining out. What do we got to complain about? I heard the birds chirping this morning. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You 
been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, no, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. And I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And all it chases me down, fights the line, found leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. Don't deserve it till you give yourself away. Love the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. Snow wall, you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. Coming after me. Snow shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. No so wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. So no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. So no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
Oh God in heaven, we are here today to worship and exalt you, to praise your name, to lift you above every other name that is in heaven, on earth, or below. For you are worthy of our praise. For we think about your love for us. You are the absolute definition of it. The word says so. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it, and yet you give it. You give it freely. God, it's scandalous when you stop and think about it because there is nothing in our human nature that says that makes sense to me. There's nothing that makes sense about it. When we look at it with our earthly eyes. For when those around us fail us, we finally end up getting to a point as humans where we say, enough's enough. I'm writing you off. You've done me wrong one too many times. And you continually say, come back, my son. Come back, my daughter. My love for you hasn't stopped. And so we worship you, Father, that we can enter the throne room today unashamed. That we can come into your presence today unashamed because of what the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, did for us. That it took our sin as far as the east is from the west. And we are now clothed in white and appear blameless because of you. So we are here today to worship you, to praise you, to stop with the busyness of life and to come together corporately and worship you. Father, I would ask that this worship thing is not just a Sunday morning activity, something that begins right around the 10.30-ish time frame. We worship for a little bit, and then we're fed, and then we go home and we just go about our day. And we get into the routine on Monday and on Tuesday, and we don't stop to say, God, I worship you, for you're worthy of it. Father, if we are not doing that daily, I would ask that you bring those reminders to us. That the first thought on our mind when we wake up out of bed is not, man, my back hurts, or man, I wish I would have gotten better sleep, or did the night really go that fast? But perhaps the thought is, God, thank you for waking me up. And in my discomfort, And in the lack of sleep I got, I will worship you for who you are because of what you've done for me. Thank you for another day on this earth where I can reflect the glory of Christ to those around me. Father, change our mindset, we ask. So that our worship isn't just words that we say and sing but it's an outpouring of our soul. It's an outpouring of who we are. Mind, body, soul, everything. For your word says, bless the Lord, O my soul, in all that is within me. Everything that is within me, bless your holy name. God, we fail at this every day, but thank you for your forgiveness for that. May we strive to worship you more and more every day. God, I thank you for reprieve. I thank you for break. I thank you, Lord, though, for coming back for being with our family here at Madawan Community Church and worshiping you together. God, this is good. And we know today, God, that you are here with us, for we have gathered in the name of Jesus today. We would ask, Lord, that you would walk with us and be with us. Wherever people are today in this church body, will you also be? Be it in the fellowship hall or in the nursery or in the 
education wing in the sanctuary. God, sit next to us, we ask. Speak to us. And may we hear from you today. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Jeremy, could you keep my mic on? Could we enter in a prayer real quick? I'm sorry. I had meant to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Can we pray for them? And I'm sure Jeff will later as well. But everything that's going on over there, we have brothers and sisters um, who are fearful, and yet God is bigger than all of this. And we are going to ask that God would use a situation like this to bring more people into his fold. Would you pray with us quickly? God, again, we, we are here to praise you. And yet, God, there's a part in our hearts that think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine as we see the news of Russia invading. And I mentioned this earlier, God, the only worry we had this morning was probably what we were going to wear to church or what we were going to eat for breakfast or whether the food was going to get done afterwards, perhaps which restaurant we're going to go to. There are people on the other side of the globe who are going, God, is this my last day on earth? What a fear. And yet, Lord, your peace is bigger than all of that. So we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ against the evil, against the destruction, against the wrong. Father, we implore you to send your angels to protect those over in Ukraine. And God, we would ask that in the midst of this uncertainty and just having us maybe shake our heads and say, what in the world is going on? that you would say, yeah, I'm still in control and watch this. Will you bring people into the fold because of what's going on? We pray for a huge change of hearts in the leadership of Russia. And may our brothers and sisters around the globe not live in fear, but may we fall on our knees and pray to you, the one who has the power to turn all this around. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have watched uh, the news about, and I maybe caught Saturday Night Live last night. I haven't watched Saturday Night Live in, like, ever. <clears throat> Even when it was good, I never watched it. <clears throat> but um, last night on Saturday Night Live, they had the Ukrainian singers from New York City open the show. And they sang a song. And I didn't understand it because it was in Ukrainian. <laughs> but it was... Uh, the Ukrainian National Prayer. And that made me curious, so I looked it up online. I did what everyone else does in America today. I Googled it. And uh, you can Google the Ukrainian National Prayer Saturday Night Live. You can listen to this wonderful chorus uh, from these singers from Ukraine that live in the United States. And, but this is the prayer that they sang on national TV for America and probably whoever else watches Saturday Night Live. This is their national prayer. I don't think we have a national prayer in the United States, but Ukraine does. It says, Lord, the great and almighty, protect our beloved Ukraine. And bless her with freedom and light from your holy rays. With learning and knowledge, enlighten us, your, our, your small children, in love, in pure, everlasting love. Let us grow, O Lord. We pray, O Lord almighty, protect our beloved Ukraine. Grant our people and country all your kindness and grace. Bless us with freedom. Bless us with wisdom. Guide us into a kind world. Bless us, O Lord, with good fortune forever and evermore. Amen. So maybe a suggestion would be to Google that today or tomorrow. Put it on your phone. And if you can, pray that prayer every day this week and say, Lord, Bless Ukraine, and bless all people of the world. Wouldn't that be a wonderful prayer, regardless of our background, and even bless Russia? Because there's a lot of citizens in Russia who don't want to be involved. 
I, I read a little news blurb that some of the soldiers says, we didn't know we were coming to kill Ukrainians. They didn't know. Tough spot to be in, isn't it? So let us pray for them and when we can, but this is our time, this is the day that we know Psalm 118.24 is a popular chorus that says, this is the day which the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, we're here today, aren't we? It was written for a national day of rejoicing, but every day we can ask that question, what is today all about that the Lord has made for us? What do we do with this day? It's a choice that we all can make in our country and in our community and here in Matawan. A couple months ago, a friend sent me an uplifting little writing about how that he views his days. He says, today when I woke up, I suddenly realized this is the best day of my life ever. There were times when I wondered, would I even make it to today? But I'm here. And because I'm here, I'm going to celebrate. Today I'm celebrating the unbelievable life I've had so far, the accomplishments, the many blessings, and yes, even the hardships that have served to make me stronger. Today, this day, I will share my excitement for life with other people. I will make someone smile. I will go out of my way to perform an unexpected act of kindness for someone I don't even know. Today, I will give a sincere compliment to somebody. Today is the day I quit worrying about what I don't have, and I start being grateful for all the wonderful things God has already given me. And as the day ends, this day, this day which the Lord has made, I'm going to lay my head down on my pillow, and I'm going to thank God for the best day of my life. And then I'm going to sleep like a contented little baby, excited with the expectation because I know that tomorrow when I wake up, it's going to be the best day of my life ever. Let's prepare our hearts to continue in worship with the song, Because of Who You Are. Thank you, Kenton. It's always good to be here. It's a privilege for me to share God's Word, and we're going to be reading the Word of God this morning. It's on the screen. It's our tradition here to stand as we read the Word of God. Do we read it together corporately? I think so. I had to remember last night, and I couldn't remember exactly what we do. I'm, I'm of a certain age. That's forgivable. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Let us read together from a couple of passages of Scripture. Shall we read together? Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. This is the word of God. You may be seated. You know, I have the joy of being a chaplain with people living in assisted living facilities in southern Michigan, and elderly people have interesting stories. I like telling humorous stories about elderly people. It seems to make people laugh, and laughter is a good thing. I like the story of one elderly lady. I think the story says an old lady. I don't know which is preferred, elderly or old. Went to a bank and presented her bank card to the teller and said, I would like to withdraw $20. The teller told her, well, for withdrawals less than $100, you need to use the ATM. The old lady wanted to know why. The teller returned her bank card and irritably told her, those are the rules, so please leave, leave if there's no further matter. There's a line of customers behind you. The old lady remained silent for a few seconds, and she handed her bank card back to the teller and said, could I please withdraw all the money I have in my account? <laughs> the teller looked up the bank balance and was astonished. She quietly leaned forward and respectfully said, you have $300,000 in your bank account, and we don't have that much cash currently to give to you. Could you come back tomorrow and make an appointment, and we'll give you your cash? The old lady remained silent for another few seconds, and she said, well, how much can I withdraw today? The teller told her she could withdraw up to $3,000. Well, she said, could I please have $3,000 now? The teller kindly handed her $3,000 with a very friendly voice and a smile to the old lady. The old lady took the $3,000. She took $20, and she put it in her purse. She looked at the teller and asked the teller to deposit $2,980 back into her account. <clears throat> the moral to the story is don't mess with old people. They spend a lifetime learning the skill of thinking and solving problems. You know, as Christians, we need to spend a lifetime learning to live a godly life, don't we? The more we practice godly living, the easier it is to live a godly life. This Wednesday in some churches is a holy day. It's a day of obligation for some denominations. What happens on Wednesday? It's called Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of the Lenten season in the church year, and different denominations practice certain disciplines of the Christian faith, particularly prayer, fasting, repentance, and almsgiving. Uh, Lent really simply means spring, from the Old English to lengthen. So this is the time of the year when the days are lengthening. And so we call this the season of Lent. The days, how many are enjoying your Lent season already? The days are getting longer. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And Lent is usually how many days long? Forty days long. The biblical passage is the temptation of Jesus in the Gospels of Luke Chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. So for 40 days, Jesus practiced the spiritual disciplines to prepare him to, for his temptation with Satan. He was spiritually strong when he went into that time of dealing with the temptation by Satan for 40 days. But you know, actually, Lent is not 40 days long. It's 46 days long. We don't count Sunday when we're doing Lent. <clears throat> How many learned something new already? Okay, we can stop. Do we have donuts available? Coffee? If you Quit when you're ahead. It's my motto. 
So often when we think about Lent, what do we think about? We usually ask someone, what are you giving up for Lent? Of course, that's the most common thought process with Lent. It's about, so we're thinking about practicing some discipline of abstinence. We give up something like food or drink or an activity or nowadays some activity on social media. Or maybe we think about doing something positive or godly for someone, some godly thing like complimenting someone every day for 40 days or something like that. You know, in the history of the church, people would often go through a time of discipleship during the Lenten season, and they would join the church on Easter Sunday. They would come on the day of resurrection that their new life had begun in Jesus Christ. So Easter Sunday was a popular time for new members, new believers in Jesus Christ to come and join the church. Did any of you join the church on an Easter Sunday? Oh, see how we've fallen by the wayside on that one. <clears throat> but it actually was very, very common in the early church. By early church, I mean the year 100, 200, and 300 And as the gospel was going forth and lots of people were being saved and coming into the church, they were coming from backgrounds where people didn't know what it was to live a Christian life. They were from decidedly non-Christian backgrounds. They weren't people who were raised in the church and fell by the wayside. These are people who lived a totally, as we say, pagan lifestyle. If you watch the show on TV, The Vikings... That's a tame version of the, of the pagan lifestyle that people were converted from. And so they said, you know, how do we help people become Christians and learn to live the Christian life? Well, we'll have an extended time of retreat, 40 days, to help teach and disciple people in the disciplines of the Christian life. We'll teach them about what Christian marriage is. We'll teach them about Christian worship. We'll teach them the Ten Commandments. We'll teach them how to live Christianly, what it is to pray to the God who is and not to an idol. We'll teach them how to go through their house and get rid of things that take them away from God. It was a decided and tempted time to help people learn to live Christianly. And then when Rome embraced the Christian faith in the middle of the 300s, all of a sudden everyone in Rome had to become a Christian, whether they were Christian or not. And the church found themselves in a situation where they had to catechize or teach people about the Christian faith, and they didn't have enough instructors to teach them. Can you imagine if all of a sudden, uh, in the state of Michigan, it was declared that everyone had to go to church? Everyone in Matawan, including Texas Corners, has to come to church now. What would you do? They said, well, we have to have a minimum standard of the expectation for catechism. And so they set a minimum standard. The minimum standard was if someone was to come into church, they'd have a period of time in which they learned the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Now, that was about 350 A.D. Now, in my library, I have a catechism of the congregational churches, How many even knew there was a catechism of the congregational churches historically? I didn't either. I grew up in a congregational church. I had pastored a church for over 12 years. I never knew such a thing existed. I picked up uh, through a, this was back before the internet. I'm that old. (laughs) And I found in a, a used bookstore the congregational catechism. I thought, what is this? And I looked in the congregational catechism And what do you think they had in there to teach people joining the church? The Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed. For everyone joining the church, they had to, and I didn't know what, I thought, well, this is pretty simple. And then I went to a seminar at this school called Calvin College, Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. And I went to a seminar about uh, teaching of people the Christian faith and the history of it. And then I realized that back in 350 A.D. or so, the decision was made that the minimum standard for catechizing people in the faith was to include those three things, and it put it all together. Now how many learned something new? How many are ready for donuts? (laughs) I've been pastoring for a long time. I know coffee and donuts speak loudly to people's hearts. 
So not only was the time meant to be a time to learn about the Christian faith, but some people who were involved in the Christian faith got involved in particularly difficult sins. And so the time of Lent became a time of repentance or fasting and repentance. That's why we have penance. Penance is doing an activity that helps us to change our habits so that we repent or change our way of thinking, and so we learn to think Christianly. That's what penance was meant to be. And so they would go through a time of, of, of unlearning a bad habit, a sinful habit, and learn a godly habit. And on Easter morning, they would come and say, you know, I was a Christian, but I fell away, and now I want to rededicate myself and be reborn again to the church. It involved an extended time of learning. Some of you are familiar with uh, Saddleback Church, Rick Warren in uh, California, and the Purpose Driven Church, the Purpose Driven Life. They had a series called 40 Days of the Purpose Driven Life. Why 40 days? Well, because it was designed for Lent. But they also developed something called Celebrate um, Recovery. The church I pastored used the Celebrate Recovery program. And it was an intentional idea to help people to learn the skills to recover from the sin in their life. It was based on the 12 steps of the Alcoholics Anonymous. And people would get together and anonymously. It's pretty hard to do that in a small town to meet at a church anonymously because everyone recognizes your truck. <coughs> so, oh, why were you at church the other day, Tom? How'd you know I was at church? Well, I saw your truck in the parking lot. So it was a bit of a challenge for anonymity because today no one wants to talk about their sin. We don't want to talk about our shortcomings. We want to keep that secret. Well, I went to church to talk about my sin at Celebrate Recovery. What sin is that, Tom? Well, that's not, you know, a bit of, so we did it for about a year, and then, you know, we couldn't find anonymity anymore. But people would tell me, and they wrote notes to me saying, you know, that was so wonderful for me to have an extended time of meeting with other people to shape my spirit and my soul in a way that I could trust these other people I was meeting with. And I learned skills on how to live godly in this present age. Sometimes during Lent, our, uh, our church did something which was kind of fun, a previous church I was at. We wrote, you, you, um, uh, sometimes during Lent, you have Lenten devotionals designed just to read during the 46 days of Lent. <clears throat> So we published our own Lenten devotional for about five or six years. We'd pick a topic, and we'd ask people to write on that topic. We'd tell them how many words maximum. We'd pick a scripture and pick a... Uh, and so this one was about Lenten uh, testimonies, how people became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Forty-six people wrote their testimony from our church family. We published it in a book. My wife wrote hers, my son, my daughter, I did. And uh, it's kind of cool. It's from 2008, and I went through and read all these testimonies, and I thought, wow, I forgot all that. Isn't that neat, the way God saved that person's life? You know, we'd, we'd publish these, and we'd hand them out the first Sunday before Lent, and people would read through these within like three days. You know, they didn't do one a day. But it was so cool because it provided uh, something to look back on, and people had a chance to express their faith. So all of this is just a little bit of background about what Lent is, but there's a biblical uh, uh, rationale for it, and it's found in 1 Timothy 4.7, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. It's the idea of training yourself for godliness. And I'm going to do something a little bit differently today. We're going to, uh, I've talked with a very capable assistant in the back and show you how I go about preparing and understanding a passage of Scripture. So we go to a site and we look up BibleHub.com. Just go to your search engine at home. You can do this at home if you want to look at a passage of Scripture and make it come alive to you to understand what the meaning is. You go and you type in Bible Hub, and then you type 1 Timothy 4.7. This isn't very big for people to see, is it? <clears throat> Can't do anything about that. Oh, a little bit. Okay. So one of the, oh, this is even cooler today. If I can do this. Look, I can, how's this? Yeah, see, I can drive your cat nuts. <clears throat> 
follow this around, and we get to, so I go to, I click on this little thing here called parallel, and now we just see the bigger thing, and I have every translation in parallel, so let's go stop right here at the, go up one, the international, next one up, NIV. So here's the NIV translation, which we used to use here. It says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Good translation. The New Living Translation says, instead, train yourself to be godly. Let's go down to, uh, let's go down to the King James. The King James says, but refuse profane and old wives' tables. And it doesn't say train. It says exercise. It's the same word but it's a different English word. Exercise thyself rather unto guidance. Let's go down the New American Standard one. There we go. But stay away from worthless stories. That sounds better than old wives' tales, doesn't it? They're typical of old women. Oh, they are old women. <clears throat> I'm sitting down there. I just lost my donut for coffee hour. <laughs> I was doing so good. <laughs> but rather discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So now we have here three words from the same Greek word. We've got train, discipline, and exercise. So what is it? So I have to see this a little bit bigger screen. You have to go back out a little bit because we're going to show, yeah. So on the right, now, yeah. Keep going up, 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 up. There's the context. So let's let's just do this. Uh, we're going to go to the Greek. Yeah, and now we'll come down. So go all the way down, and uh, um, got to go up a little bit. Not all the way down. I'm sorry. There we go. There is the word gymnase. Sounds like gymnasium, doesn't it? What do you do in a gymnasium? You do what? Exercise. Some people exercise. <laughs> I've been to a gymnasium. Some people just talk. <laughs> you know, suck on their bottles, you know, wear their athletic gear. You exercise. You discipline yourself. You practice various disciplines. You, you, you know, you train yourself for a specific sport over and over. It's repetitive sometimes. I mean... Talk about repetitive things, and, and that's what that word is, is right there. It means, so let's look it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right here. This is the Strong's Concordance, so just click on that. And this comes up with a cool little screen. Ooh, isn't that neat? Now we go down. There's Strong's Concordance, and it says, Gymnazo, to exercise naked. This is getting fun. Because, <laughs> you know, in... In the Greek gym, they didn't want to be encumbered with their togas. So when they exercised and they practiced, they were naked. They didn't have anything. They were unashamed. I think that's something to be said about exercising our spirits sometime. Because I think one of the biggest handicaps in learning to grow in the Lord is that we're ashamed of certain things. And we don't want to talk about it. And so maybe there's a little bit of insight here in why they chose this word. Sometimes we have to come and allow ourselves to just... I, I used to go to the gym all the time. I was a gym rat at one point in time. And, uh, you know, when I first started, I was very self-conscious. But by the time I got in shape, I wasn't self-conscious at all. I didn't care what anyone else was doing because I want, was there for my own benefit. Sometimes I'd even... The whole goal of going to work out was to forget about everything else and to get into the zone. And so when I was swimming laps, I didn't want to think about ministry. I didn't want to think about other stresses. So I'd be laughing away. And one time I was so zoned out and I'd, I'd repeat scripture, like Psalm 23. I could say Psalm 23 in one lap across the pool. And I would just be laughing away, and eventually I would just be zoning into it. And one time I was so zoned out that I hit the wall of the pool. Oh, what's this? So we're exercising, but we're going to keep on going down here to exercise. Okay, I train by physical exercise, hence train in the widest sense. Keep on going down. Right around, let's see. 
to train with one's full effort, with complete physical, emotional force, like when working out intensely in a gymnasium. Keep on going down. This uh, full discipline has to be in top working condition. This is gained only from constant, rigorous training. Conveys acquiring proficiency through practice. So here the thought is, I like that. I don't know, you can't put that into one word. But if I was to go back to our text and I was to look at our text, it says that uh, rather gain proficiency through practicing godliness. Become proficient at being a godly person. And that means we put effort into learning how to be godly until we become proficient and can do this without thinking about it. So we can go on to a, so the goal of our Christian faith is to exercise, part of our Christian faith is to exercise ourselves so that we become proficient in being godly. So to the point where we don't even think about doing it. Let's go to Hebrews 5.14. Hmm. There's a, yeah, let's just, yeah, that's the best way. Hebrews 5.14. There's another way of doing it, but I can't see it here. We didn't practice this, so we're just, you know. <clears throat> and we go down to Hebrews 5.14, and let's go up and just hit the Greek right there. We'll hit the Greek. And it says, for the, the mature, however, for the mature, keep going down. Uh, solid food is for the mature. The ones, keep going who through constant use have their senses trained, gymnazamena, geg gymnazamena, having for distinguishing between good and evil. So the idea of this spiritual training is to train so that we can learn the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. We can train ourselves to do evil, or we can train ourselves to do good. A number of years ago, a couple came to me after a few years of marriage, and the wife was very upset with her husband, and the husband was obviously very embarrassed to be coming to talk to the pastor. The husband apparently had been unfaithful, and the wife was furious, and both attitudes were destructive to their marriage. I listened, and I clarified, and I listened, and the wife was so mad, she said, I'm going to kill that other woman. And I asked the couple if they were willing to put as much energy into growing their marriage as they were into destroying their marriage. And they paused. They had not thought of it that way. They were just intent on expressing a lot of energy because they were upset and embarrassed. I said, how about you focus all this energy I'm getting from both of you into, into growing your marriage. I looked at the woman and I said, would you be willing to put all this anger you have and focus it towards growing your marriage? And she said, you know, I think I would. And the guy said, I said, you know, we all make mistakes. Are you willing to put all this energy into growing your marriage? I said, I think I would. I said, well, let me suggest some spiritual disciplines that we can go through in the next 40 days and see if it makes a difference. And I suggested the Love Dare book. Some of you may have gone through the Love Dare. I continue to use that as a great tool to encourage people to develop the skill of expressing love to one another because something wasn't happening in their marriage relationship. They needed to learn a skill. It's been quite some time, and that couple are still married, and their marriage is thriving. Their marriage is healthy. It's vital and godly today. You see, God isn't opposed to effort. It actually takes effort to live a godly life. He's opposed to earning our salvation. We can't earn our salvation. That's a gift. But when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, then he helps us with the effort of training ourselves through constant practice to live a godly life. Hebrews 12, 11. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 11, and I'll cut this. Hmm. 
Let's go to parallel. So I, we type in Hebrews 12, 11. Oh, Hebrews 12, 11. There we go. Then we get there, and we're going to go to, yeah, well, this is good right there. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Discipline is a different word. It means to raise as a child. How many have discovered that raising a child's not easy? <laughs> How many of you as children think it's easy? <laughs> Parents got it made. I can't wait till I'm a parent. And as a parent, you discover, you know, it's not easy to be a child and to listen to your parents either. Because <clears throat> parents tell you what to do. Usually for your benefit. Like, don't put that knife in that electrical socket. There's a good reason for that, right? And it doesn't seem pleasant to the child. No, no discipline, no grazing seems pleasant to the child, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been gone through the exercising process and have learned the skill to become competent in godliness. So, you know, we've all learned. This is a very positive approach to learning. It's a very positive approach to godliness. You know, learning and growing is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. How many of you remember learning to read? How many can read? <laughs> okay. So you all can read. You develop the skill of reading, but you don't remember the process you went through to learn to read. You were so immersed in a culture that believes in literacy that you learned to read I'm sure there are times when someone said, you know, that's not the right way to use your grammar. I'm sure someone corrected you here and there about reading, and I'm sure you were had proud moments when people affirmed your reading. Our children, when they were younger, we gave them a penny a page for every time they were reading. So that they went on vacation. That's how they earned their vacation money. At the end of the year, they earned like $150. It's a lot of pennies. And neither one of them can tell you how they learned to read. But there was just a commitment in our household to literacy. How many of you can say the Lord's Prayer? How many remember learning the Lord's Prayer? Most of you learned it just by coming to church and being around other Christians, am I right? I know that when I teach confirmation where we teach the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments, I never have to teach the Lord's Prayer. I just talk about it and about what it means for someone who's now 13 years of age. But they already know it. I don't have to teach the Ten Commandments. Because they've grown up around it, it's been part of their culture, but I remind them and, and encourage them for someone at 13 to understand it in a fuller way. That's the process of spiritual discipline in our life. We keep on growing all of our life, and then when we're older, we still keep on applying those skills that we learn throughout our life. So, you know, the same is said for the idea of godliness. It's a lifetime process. So Lent is an extended time to focus on the spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith so that we can grow in godliness. You know, today we're going to be taking communion, and we're going to exercise our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed together. You know, these are things that you just learn by growing up in the church, isn't it? It's something that we can learn together. So... Let us prepare ourselves for taking the uh, Lord's Supper. I'm done with my sermon now. All you can applaud. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> it's all done. So let us, uh, we have the Apostles' Creed that we're going to be saying together. Shall we say together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead." I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen.
Well, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent to the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for all of us the obedience to divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We also come to have communion with Jesus Christ. He has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. And in the breaking of the bread, we, we make, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. And then we come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love, of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come. When with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. So I invite all people who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to partake in the communion that we are about to, part, uh, to serve this morning. As we do so, let us have a time of prayer, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, today we awoke to the best day of our life. And we arose and to a mighty strength, the invocation of the Almighty Trinity, a belief in the threeness and a confession of the oneness of the Creator of creation. Today we bind ourselves to the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, to the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, to the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, to the strength of his descent into the judgment of doom. Today, as we take communion, we confess our sins before you. We bind ourselves to you in holiness and commit ourselves to put effort into living a godly life. We would ask, Lord God, that you would surround us with your presence, that your strength would be there to pilot us, your strength to uphold us, your wisdom to guide us, your eye to look before us and your ear to hear for us, your word to speak for us and your hand to guard us, to save us from the snares of the devils, the temptation of vices, and from anyone who would wish us ill or damage. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. As we serve communion, we'll be serving communion the same way we did it the last time here at, uh, at Madawan Community. I'll be here serving the bread. The elders will be here with the communion cups, and you'll come down the aisle, and uh, we'll receive the bread, and you may take it when you're ready, and then go to the cups. And then when you're done with your cup, there'll be a tray that you can put it in. Shall we ask the elders to come forward? The Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and he took the cup and he gave thanks for it and we'll do the same. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, a Eucharist, for the bread that Jesus Christ came down to, from heaven to earth as the incarnate Christ and he died on the cross for us. He showed us how to live life and how to be godly in the present with the hope of the future. And we thank you for the cup that we're about to take as a cup of blessing is a cup of redemption, and that it renews our covenantal relationship with you. May you bless all who partake of this meal this day. In Christ's name, amen. I invite you to come forward and to partake in the Lord's Supper.
Oops, I'll do another one. Save communion. Do this in remembrance of me. Yourselves the communion bread. Okay. I forgot the offering, didn't I? this time we'll receive our tithes and our offerings for the ministry of the Madawan Community Church. Our closing hymn this morning is Just a Closer Walk with Thee. It'll be on the screen, and if you want, it's also on the hymnal on number 380. We'll begin with the refrain. I guess we'll just follow the words on the screen. Shall we stand and sing?
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.